we're going to undertake a study of the book of Joshua. And some of you know we did this some time ago, and uh, we're doing it a second time for a number of reasons. But um, the uh, the book of Joshua is uh, an interesting, interesting book. Um, I could argue, I can give you a number of reasons why Joshua should be an exciting book. First of all, he's a warrior. You know, it's kind of fun, you know, to to, to deal with these books. Uh, I, I, most of us who are professional executives in the business world have a tendency to lean heavily on Daniel and Joseph because both of them were professional administrators. Uh, both of them were executives. You know, you find all kinds of walks of life in the Scripture. But you and I and most of many of us here who are in the business world kind of can relate to someone who had administrative responsibility, and both Joseph and Daniel are cast in that role in the Scripture. And, of course, it's all. I also point out they're the only two people in the Scripture about whom there's no evil spoken of, except Christ, of course. And uh, so uh, uh, and so, he, I'm not suggesting that that links to the fact that they were executives. I just sort of uh, throw that out. But now Joshua is a little different breed of cat here. Uh, Joshua um, we can relate to for some different reasons. He's a warrior. He's a soldier. He's a leader. Uh, he comes from the tribe of Ephraim. His relatives were cattle thieves. That gives you some kind of a, uh, really, and that gives you some kind of, he comes from kind of a turbulent background. But you're going to discover he is one interesting guy. And so the book will be fun for that reason. There's lots of action. And um, what's also true, there's lots of practical lessons um, in, in his walk and what the book, what the book deals with uh, in their historical context also has parallels for you and I in terms of our personal walk. And you may say, well, gee, that doesn't sound that exciting. I can get a lot of Bible studies with that sort of thing. And, and I'm not going to apologize for that, but I'm really leading up to there's vastly more exciting dimensions, at least to me, of, of Joshua. I don't want to minimize the homiletic or practical aspects of the book. In fact, Alan Redpath is very famous for having done a book called Victorious Christian Living, which is basically a commentary in the book of Joshua and linking it to the book of Ephesians. He marries them together, shows how they're parallel, how uh, what Joshua is dealing with in practical historical conquest terms in uh, in Israel. Ephesians deals with us instead of Israel, it's the church, and instead of earth, it's the heavenlies. But he, he draws a parallel, and and uh, Redpath does an excellent job at that. And that's an interesting commentary. We'll touch on that only lightly. We're really heading in a much more bizarre path. Those of you that follow my studies uh, know that uh, maybe not too practical, but off the wall for sure, and that's where we're headed. Um, there's another dimension to Joshua that uh, does bear some comment, and that is is that the issues that Joshua deals with are issues for today. Joshua has a group of people, like a million of them, that don't come as pilgrims to Canaan. They come as invaders. They come to dispossess the land of its present inhabitants and take over. And if you have, you know, Arab sympathizers, I suppose, could make a big thing out of the book of Joshua, but they better read very carefully if they do, because it gets very interesting. The whole issue of Israel's claim to the land underlies this book. And this is where the promises to Abraham made earlier and reconfirmed all the way through to Moses and what have you are going to be consummated. They're actually going to go in and take over this land. And so it's kind of uh, interesting from a political sense because those very issues that started with Joshua are um, subjects of conversation in every major capital on the planet Earth today and probably uh, are commented on in every military headquarters of substance uh, in the world today. Israel's right to the land, and uh, it's a point of some interesting dispute. But there's another dimension to the book of Joshua that motivates me to... Uh, sort of jump into this sort of thing. And those of you that know my particular peculiar tastes or bizarre turn of mind, uh, you may find it provocative to realize that we're going to study the book of Joshua as a book of prophecy. Now, we don't normally think of Joshua as a prophet. The book of Joshua is a historical book. In some sense, it's almost an extension of the Torah. And uh, uh, not quite, uh, come back to all that, but the point is it's, it, con it continues, of course, where the Torah leaves off and, and talks with the first five books of the Torah deal with uh, Israel outside the land. From Joshua on, we have Israel in the land, and uh, um, there's some things we'll talk about there. But uh, one of the things that um, 
this is a good time since we're starting a new book. I'd like to just cover some broad presuppositional ideas that tend to dominate my personal thinking and approach to the scripture that may or may not be meaningful to you, but let me sort of throw them out front anyway so you know at least what kind of a nut you've taken up with here. Um, my first pre- uh, uh, presupposition that I'm laying out for all of us to consider is that the Bible is a message system. Let me sound, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that you have on your laps or on your desk or wherever a, a collection of 66 books that were written by 40 authors over a period of many thousands of years that have been engineered and designed very intricately as a singular message system. A single author, really. And the first concept is that it is a system. It has integrity of design. The idioms, the structure, the theme, the interlinkings are not by accident. They're engineered into the basic document. Even though its elements come from some 40 different penmen over thousands of years, it's been skillfully designed. That leads to a part of that presupposition that's a little startling, that this message system has had to have its origin outside the time domain. And uh, that leads to a, uh, a little bit of digression here. What do I mean by a time domain? And some of you that have been with me in some of these studies may say, gee, you've you heard me prattle about this before. Um, uh, you and I, as uh, just victims of a three-dimensional space and presumably some kind of common upbringing, have a linear concept of time. You and I, if we're products of the Western civilization, uh, have we think of time as linear, as a line. We've all in school drawn a, a timeline. On a blackboard here, I could start at the left and draw a line to the right, and the point on the left might be a birth, at the end of the line might be a death, or the beginning of the line might be the beginning of the United States. Or we, you know, we make we make timelines, and uh, uh, we can have things start and end on, on on a line. We think of time as linear, which causes us to make some interesting um, presumptions when we start talking about things like God or eternity. We think of simply a being who has a timeline that starts at infinity over here and goes on to infinity over here. We think of God as simply a line with no limit. We think of infinity as just a very, very long line. And what we fail to understand, I mean, that's just a logical extension from this linear presumption of time. Now, if we've been schooled in modern physics and, and, and we understand that time is a physical property, just like mass, height, weight, distance, um, that time is inextricably linked to mass. And we can't talk about uh, time in an absolute sense that way. It's relative. And that's the whole issue of, of the Lorentz transformations, the whole issue of, uh, of uh, certain uh, you know, quantum physics, and a lot of things are all based on the, the recognition that we can only properly speak of space-time. Your time domain is a function of your own acceleration. If you're going faster or if you're, you know, let, let me go... The faster you go, the less you know, you have, your time relative to somebody else changes. The old cliche about two twin astronauts of the same age. One goes on the mission, one doesn't. When the other guy comes back, he's younger than his brother. And uh, the whole point being that his time has changed. It's warped, if you will. It's a popular theme in literature, but we generally associate it with fiction. Um, uh, there have been physics experiments which talk about reversal, time reversals, where an electron reverses in time for a brief period to become a positron. And those kinds of things. If you read those kinds of papers, you this is old ideas to you. But the point is, if time is a physical property, then if you cease to have mass, you don't have time. And if you speak of God as something extra physical, not limited to the constraints of mass as we think of it, then he's not limited to time at all. So it's not a question of a God simply being a law, having lots of time. He's outside the time domain altogether. Uh, we mathematically do this all the time uh, when we have a problem in engineering that won't lend itself to a solution in the space-time domain, we'd convert it to, say, another domain, say, the frequency domain. Many of you in this room probably have used or at least heard of the thing called Fourier transforms, a mathematical device to transfer a problem or a statement from the space-time domain to the frequency domain, where it often will yield to analysis, and then you convert it back. Those of you that have bought stereo equipment use Fourier transforms. You say that a 
piece of an amplifier is flat from 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. What do you mean? It has a characteristic that's spread, not in time, but in frequency. And you, in effect, are using a Fourier transform to make those kinds of statements. And, of course, there's Lorentz transforms. There's all kinds of transforms, and if you're in advanced math, you get into this. The whole point being, though, philosophically, God is outside the time domain. Now, if God is outside the time domain, he, and he obviously has created us in a physical world within the time domain, he obviously has the technology to get us a message. But the problem is, how does he validate that message? How does he send this message to us from outside the time domain and let us know, hey, it's something out there trying to communicate to us? One way is that since he is outside time, he alone can see the end from the beginning. And the way he authenticates that message is to describe to us something before it happens. Now, biblically, we have this cliche we call prophecy. One of the dimensions of prophecy that's so fascinating is that it's an authentication of the message. It's a, a, a validation that the source of this collection of 66 books has not only engineered this very tightly, very carefully, but he's done it with the characteristic that it will describe things before they happen. And uh, we, of course, have the, the, the most dramatic example of that is, of course, the, the person and mission and accomplishments of none other than Jesus Christ. And his entire, all the details of his life foretold thousands of years in advance and fulfilled, of course, in his first coming. Over 333 specific details recorded in the Old Testament fulfilled in his first coming. Over 500 details yet to be fulfilled in the second coming. And, of course, that always excites our interest. Now, um, it's in this vein that um, uh, we're going to discover some amazing things about the book of Joshua. One reason we're jumping into the book of Joshua isn't only because it's a very interesting and very practical and very timely book. One reason we're going to jump into the book of Joshua is because I'm going to share with you some discoveries that, to the best of my knowledge, are not in print. Uh, some insights that you can find for yourself and judge for yourself as to whether they have meaning or not. And uh, But before I do, lest you think that I'm soft off in left field somewhere, in some kind of a screwball, you may recall that when we studied the book of Isaiah or, and, or, and or Jeremiah, I suggested to you that the book is not only is it tightly organized, but it has encryptions in it. Uh, in the, in the, there's a form of a Hebrew encryption called Atbas that happens to show up in Jeremiah 25 and 51 and 57. And there's also a type of encryption called Album, which shows up in Isaiah chapter 7 twice. Well, uh, I thought this would be interesting because I have in my hand an article that I received today. It's Dateline Jerusalem comes over United Press International. And at Port Rand, I won't read the whole thing, of course. Israeli researchers using a computer say they have found encoded messages in the Bible, giving new support to the belief that the book's every word is divinely inspired. The researchers said that in the book of Esther, they found, or it goes on, I want, some of these get kind of technical. Basically what they've done is they had the computer scan the Hebrew text. And in one case, they had it look at every 50th word. 50 is a significant number for several reasons. It is um, because it's uh, 50 days in, you know, uh, relative to the uh, you know, uh, Passover and Shavuot, and then also the, uh, the uh, uh, Jubilee year and all that. And we're going to discuss that in some depth when we get in further into the book of Joshua. But it turns out that if you take um, the, um, um, the computer looking at the Torah, found the word Elohim, the name for God, hidden by taking every 15th letter. How many times do you think? Once, twice, seven times? How about 147 times? And it says, and this is among, excuse me, this is among the letters of the book of Genesis. 147 times the name Elohim shows up by using that form of selection on the computer. You said the probability of that happening by chance would be about one in two million. They did the same thing with the book of, um, let's see, they used the, uh, the, uh, uh, they used 26, and 26 happens to be relevant because of, um, let's see if I can find out why they took these, picked these particular numbers of, of things. Um, or one of the Hebrew names for God is Yahweh, and his Hebrew letters are translated in numbers. Yahweh becomes 26. When they did that, they also found the name of Aaron in the book of Leviticus 25 times. The probability of that happening by chance is one in uh, half a million. Um, it goes on here then, too. It talks about uh, um, in the start of uh, four of the five books of the Bible, the computer counted every 50th letter and found the word Torah. In the third book, Leviticus, which is about worship, the name Elohim was found hidden. In Genesis 12, the Lord promised the patriarch Abraham the land of Canaan, modern Israel. The computer found the names Jerusalem and Moriah, the mountain on which the temple was built some hundreds of years later. 
all hidden in the crypts. Now, the point is uh, that the text has properties that you can't simulate by hand. And by the way, what makes this so interesting is that if you drop one letter, it all falls apart. In other words, this is a property of the text that hangs on the fact of being letter perfect, which is kind of interesting, I think. Huh? So now I'm not going to make a big thing of this. It's an interesting article, but it highlights this, uh, this, this respect we might have for the book. Now, you and I say, well, gee, that's great. What can I do? I don't have a, a, a computer, and I, or if I do, I should say I don't have a copy of the Hebrew text. By the way, I understand you can get those now for personal computers, for those of you that want to make the investment. But and happen to know Hebrew and want to play with that. But uh, the point is uh, uh, that may or may not lead to some practical result. There are evidences of in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit has put there for your amazement, for your discovering. Okay, and it's often fun to find these things, uh, you know, discover them for yourself. So before we go out this way too far, let me remind all of you that are involved in this crazy exercise. Uh, to write Acts 17.11 at the top of your notepad. Now, Acts 17.11 is uh, uh, probably ought to be my next license plate because I use that so much. But Acts 17.11, of course, is where Luke tells you not to believe a thing Chuck Missler tells you. Uh, uh, Luke is talking about the revival they experienced in Berea, which was very exciting, just like the one they had in Thessalonica, except he says in Acts 17.11, these were more noble, that is, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that... They receive the word with all readiness of mind, as I hope you do, but they search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And so the license I'm going to take in this whole series, as I always do, is one of uh, going out in the left field, off the wall, trusting you to be true to Acts 17.11. Don't believe a thing I tell you. Um, I pride myself, having read James, I'm not excited about being a teacher. I, uh, I understand the burden on teachers, so I don't regard myself as a teacher, despite people attempting to label me as such. I really uh, regard myself as just someone that's going to stimulate you to do your own study. And if I can find some things to sort of intrigue you or excite you or point you off in some constructive direction, my time is well spent. Um, the thing I do hope you will discover from this exercise, uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure you'll pick up a lot of practical insight from Joshua that can apply to your life, but I think you'll also, I'm hoping you'll find a, a new excitement in the Scripture and a new awareness that the Holy Spirit is very actively involved between you and that book, and he's going to show you some things that go far beyond, far beyond the awareness of Joshua himself. I think you're going to discover, obviously, uh, much of what he knew is not in the book, but likewise, much is in the book, I think, goes far beyond what he knew. Now, what do you mean by that, Chuck? Well, let's, uh, let me just give you a quick glimpse of Joshua as a mystical book. Now, the minute you discover that the name of the book is Yehoshua, means Jehovah is salvation, that's, G, that, that's Hebrew, Yehoshua. What would be that name in Greek? Jesus, right. Now, the minute you realize that we have a book in the Old Testament that has, that is like Jesus' namesake, you immediately catches your attention to see, gee, is the Holy Spirit playing some kind of game with us here? Is there a parallel that we might look for? Because all through the Scripture we speak of various people who are models of Christ or types of Christ. Uh, Adam in his way, Moses in his, certainly Joseph, and you can go through these. Well, certainly Joshua, then we're not surprised to be a, not only a type of Christ, but perhaps far more. Um, as we jump into this kind of a thing, as we jump into the Joshua, we're going to discover there's a battle of Jericho. We're going to be very surprised as to who really fought the battle of Jericho. It wasn't what the song likes to get you to believe. The guy that fought the battle of Jericho wasn't Joshua, and we'll discover that when we get to chapter 5. So a very interesting character is leading the battle of Jericho. Um, someone who insists that he be worshipped with your shoes off. And that isn't an angel. Angels don't allow themselves to be worshipped. This is the head of the Lord's host, who uses the same words he used out of the burning bush, take off thy shoes, you are on hallowed ground. That's the guy that leads the battle of Jericho, and we'll see in Joshua 5. But more importantly, as we study the battle of Jericho, we're going to discover that almost every rule that God laid down is broken. The Ark of the Covenant was not to go to war. The Ark of the Covenant is in the procession against Jericho. The Levites were not numbered in the army, remember? Numbers? But wait a minute, the Levites are in the entourage marching around Jericho. And they're supposed to work six days and rest the seventh, but not at Jericho. Once around the Jericho a day for six days, and the seventh day to go around seven times. And oh, by the way, all the way along, you're supposed to keep quiet, not make a sound. 
You may miss that unless you watch Joshua carefully. He's supposed to keep silent. And on the seventh time on that seventh day, they shout, blow the trumpets, and the walls come down. Now, prior to going to Jericho, they do something else. They send in two spies, as we call them, two guys to reconnoiter the land. Now, they didn't bring back any military intelligence that had any impact at all on the battle plan, believe me. So the question is, what did those two guys who were reconnoitering the land accomplish? They had a date with a gal by the name of Rahab. They saw that she was saved. So I'm going to call those two people witnesses. Now, we discover that what's really going on is Yehoshua is taking God's people and dispossessing the land of the usurpers. And he does this. He's facing seven nations. Originally ten. Three have been put down. There's seven left. There's seven nations there. Now, And how long is the campaign? Seven years. Ooh, now, as students of Revelation, we're getting a little creepy feeling in the back of our neck, right? We've got Yehoshua leading his people to dispossess the land of the usurpers, facing seven nations. When I tell you that those seven nations are aligned to, allying themselves under a king who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, that gets even more interesting. And this guy is defeated with signs in the sun and the moon. The days are not long enough for Joshua's battles. He's a goer. And they defeat them at the Battle of Beth Horn. And what do the kings who are defeated do? They go into the caves and say, and hide. Does that sound like Revelation? Where the kings hide in the caves and rocks fall on us? Sending in two witnesses in advance? Doing it with seven trumpets? You follow my message? I'm going to suggest to you something that I don't believe. I've talked to a number of people that have, uh, that are well-read. Hal Lindsey, Walter Martin, and others. Have, if this idea is anywhere in print, and I have not found it anywhere, and that's one reason why we're doing the study, and one reason we may do a little book out of it, is that the idea that Joshua is a deliberately designed foreshadowing, a model of the book of Revelation, is an interesting idea. And you don't have to trust me. It may be a wrong idea. Test it for yourself. We're going to go through the book of Joshua and study it. I'm going to assume most of you have been through the book of Revelation. If you haven't, I encourage you, obviously, to do so. You'll draw your own conclusions whether there's a fit or not. And then you'll ask yourself, gee, is it possible that this conquest of the land is, that Israel, where here it's Joshua and Israel and the land of Canaan, isn't but a small foreshadowing of another military leader who is going to take his people to dispossess his inheritance of its usurpers and establish the inheritance where it belongs. And in this case, it won't be Israel, it's the church, it won't be Canaan, it'll be the planet Earth. And it may be very, very soon. And isn't it interesting that mystically here we have the whole idea of the Jubilee year instituted in Joshua. It's instituted early in the scripture, but it starts when the conquest of the land is over, the Jubilee year. You know, seven years, six years they cultivate the soil, and the seventh they're supposed to lay it life fallow, the week of years. After seven of those, i.e. 49, the next year is a jubilee year in which three things are supposed to happen. All debts are forgiven, all slaves go free, and the land returns to its owners in the Israeli economy. It's the time of restitution of all things. Well, as we know, all things, we're told, were written, you know, as a shadow of things to come, Colossians 2.16 tells us. Well, if that's the case... What is a jubilee year prophetically? Well, Peter in his second sermon in Acts chapter 3 makes, makes reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ as the time of the restitution of all things. Aha, uh -huh. where the debts are forgiven, yours and mine, where the slaves go free, and where the land returns to its owners, who? Israel under the, under the millennium. So is the jubilee year some kind of trigger, some kind of yardstick against which to measure time? Interesting question. Christ opened his ministry on the anniversary of the 29th Jubilee. The church has been in ruling on the earth for about 40 Jubilees. 69 of them are behind us. We're entering the 70th. Is that going to be relevant? He says, how often does he forgive? 70 times 7. Most of us take that as a figure of speech. Four times Israel had a 490-year period of grace. This, the fourth one being the Daniel 70-week thing, which is still to go. The 70 times 7 is, is not just an idiom. It's a a, 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 it, well, it's an idiom that God uses in more ways than just a remark to his disciples in the Gospels. So Joshua is going to be an interesting book. It's going to be an interesting book because it's got a lot of action. It's an interesting book because you and I are going to learn as Joshua wins and loses as he goes, lots of lessons for your life and mine. We're also going to get a feeling for what is all this about Israel's claim to the land in a political sense that we're facing today every time we read the paper. But perhaps to me, the most interesting thing is to find once again the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit upon this text. And I don't mean just Joshua, I mean the whole thing. 
Or if you want to put your tongue in your cheek, you can facetiously argue that you can prove by the principles of textual criticism the book of Joshua had to be written after the book of Revelation. Okay. So uh, that's by way of sort of a, a preview. Um, the book of Joshua is, of course, comes after the Torah. It's probably useful for us to psychologically put ourselves in the place of um, having gone through the scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Joshua. Now, Genesis, of course, is the book of beginnings. All kinds of things begin in Genesis. Everything that begins in Genesis is consummated in the book of Revelation. You can make lists of those. They fit. That's fascinating. But the three main things is heaven and earth and Israel begin the book of Genesis. And, of course, we get to Exodus. We have the book of the delivery. No, back up. Uh, the theme of, of Genesis, while the story is beginnings, the basic doctrinal idea in Genesis is election. God again and again goes out of his way to demonstrate his sovereignty. The rights of the firstborn are often switched, so it's not by flesh, it's by God's election all the way through. And we have the, uh, Paul in his epistle to the Romans, he says how he, the, those he, whom he predestinated, th- th- them who he foreknew, them he predestinated, whom he predestinated, them he called, whom he called, them he justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. And what he's doing is taking you through the patriarchs. The election or predestination is Abraham. The call is I, by Isaac, his seed was called. Um, the justification is Jacob. If you can justify Jacob, you can justify any of us. Praise God. And the glorification, of course, Joseph was glorified. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are the four patriarchs. And Paul uses that model that's in the back of his mind in Romans 8. And so this whole idea of election, but you can take it away. You're talking about Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and, of course, Ephraim, where Joseph's hands are crossed and the blessings. All those ideas in Genesis constantly lurking behind the scenes is God's sovereignty, his, his ability to choose. And, of course, that relates to you and I because we've been chosen before the foundation of the earth was laid. You and I were chosen before Genesis. And somebody has pointed out, I'm glad he chose me then because he might change his mind if he knew me now. But Okay. Exodus, then, of course, is the deliverance of Israel from bondage. Exodus, the, 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 the Exodus is regarded biblically as the birth of the nation. Obviously, Genesis, the first few chapters are creation and all that, but to quickly get to chapter 12 on, it's the story of Abraham and his family climaxing in the 12 sons, and they're getting into Egypt. But it's still not regarded a nation until after the Passover, after the deliverance from Egypt. Egypt is regarded as the, so to speak, the, the place that the nation is born, and deliverance of bodies. The theme of Exodus, of course, is redemption. We have the whole role of the shed blood, the, the, the Passover lamb and all of that, and uh, the whole concept of redemption by grace, the burning bush, the thorn bush of the desert, the thorn bush being the symbol of the curse, the bur- the the bush burning but not being consumed. So we have the, the curse, the symbol of the curse, the thorns in the fire but not being consumed. It's a model of grace, strangely enough, a Levitical model of grace. The whole concept of the Passover lamb, all those ideas are in Exodus. Exodus is the book of redemption and Revelation being, of course, the climax of that. The th- third book of the Torah being Leviticus, really only a two, something less than two months in history, but it's obviously the document for fellowship and worship. It deals with the tabernacle, the principles of sanctification, all those ceremonial rites to teach us the concepts of fellowship and worship of a holy God. That brings us to Numbers, and Numbers is starting to get important to us to understand Joshua, because in Numbers we have what's called the wilderness wanderings. We're going to look at that in a little more depth shortly, because it's too important for us not to understand that before getting into Joshua. But basically, Numbers is the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. It's their failure to enter, their failure to overcome, and their failure to occupy the land. Doctrinally, Numbers is a book that describes the failure of unbelief. There were 10 plagues in uh, Exodus, and there are 10 occasions in Numbers where they blow it. And it's interesting they fit. But anyway... Uh, we'll look at specifically how the wilderness wanderings came about and why Joshua and Caleb are such unique figures in a moment. But just to keep the overview in mind, we have Deuteronomy coming next. And Deuteronomy, of course, is a obedience as a precondition of, every, of God revealing himself and everything else. It's a call to obedience. Deuteronomy is probably the favorite book of Jesus Christ. He quoted from it more than any other book in the Scripture. And it's also a bridge between the first four books and the next seven. Every book... That uh, except Deuteronomy, opens with the word, in your English, in King James, it says the word now. The Hebrew word is ve. It actually should be and. It's a connective. 
So uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers connect, okay? Also, uh, Joshua onward, all the way to First Chronicles, they all have this connective, except Deuteronomy. It's the bridge between the first four books in which Israel is outside the land and the, last, the next seven books where they're inside the land, essentially. So that's the Torah, and that sets the stage for the book of Joshua. The Torah leaves them wandering in the wilderness, Moses having failed. He blows it at Meribah, where he is to, to uh, uh, provide water for the people from the rock, but he does it in such a way as to imply to the people that God is angry, and he wasn't. So he calls Moses on the side and puts him in the penalty box. He didn't, well, you were not an adequate witness. And you think he's a little rough. He says, Moses, because of that, you're not going to enter the promised land. And Moses tries to plead, and he says, I don't want to hear about it again. The Lord tells him not to bring it up again. And uh, what he does do, he allows Moses to see the promised land from a hill before he dies, and the Lord buries him. And uh, at just about the time you think you understand that story, you get back in the tail end of the Bible there. Jude tells us that, gives us a strange story where Michael has to fight with Satan over Moses' body, and what all that's about is another whole bizarre thing that we can leave for another evening. But the point is, it's interesting. And uh, Moses does, of course, enter the promised land. Who knows when he shows up in the promised land? Matthew 17, the transfiguration. He and Elijah show up for a staff meeting. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as you probably know, I'm one of these screwballs that thinks that he also shows up in Revelation 11. But that's another, again, another another argument for another evening. Um, Joshua is divided into three parts. Entering the land, overcoming the land, and occupying the land. The, fir the, land. the first five chapters, um, we have Joshua entering the land. And in some respects, that's going to be the uh, among the most interesting. Then, of course, overcoming the land, the next six, the chapter 6 through 12, he'll be having all these interesting battles. He wins a few, loses a few. And then, uh, finally, occupying the land uh, from chapters 13 to 24. They divide it up, and there's some interesting lessons there. But it's uh, the book of Joshua can be titled The Victory of Faith. It tells you how to win. You guys like to win? Do you ever have a feeling you're not winning spiritually? Do you ever have a feeling you're sort of set back? You know, you, you come to Sunday morning or, or some evening and you get all stirred up because there's a good message or something or you hear somebody on the radio and you read change it. And then somehow over the next few days, it doesn't work that way. You sort of get set back, right? Um, Joshua's going to give us the answers. Isn't that a bold statement? Joshua's going to have the answers because you're going to see when he wins and when he loses and he's going to tell you how you win. Practically. Not in some soft, fuzzy concept that you can't quite get your hands on. He's going to tell you how to win. He's going to tell you how to prosper. He's going to tell you how to make your way prosperous. I don't mean spiritually alone. I mean financially. Make thy way prosperous. The word is very straightforward. I'm not going to promise you're going to be rich. Don't misunderstand me. But I am saying he will tell you what you have to do to win. And whatever it is that you're fighting. That's what Joshua's all about. He's also going to show you how to lose. Lest you miss the lesson, he blows it a few times so you can really see it from both sides. We're going to find out what happened at Ai and why and, and so on. The victory of faith, that's what Joshua's all about. That's the practical side. So, um, okay, so that's the, the, the overview of the book um, uh, as how it fits in. Um, at this point, as we jump into a new book like this, it's hard to get started because I'd like to give you some, some broader background. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, we probably should do is examine Joshua before we get to the book of Joshua. He shows up some interesting places. In the interest of time, we won't go into all the detail here. We first find him. There's a law in biblical exposition called the uh, law of first mention. When you first see a subject introduced... It's usually very, very relevant to its, to its subsequent use in the scripture. The word love first appears when Abram offers, offers Isaac. For God loved the world that he gave his only... And to the extent that Abram is acting out prophecy, it, of course, is an anticipation of John 3.16. First place the word love appears, Genesis 22. Well, anyway, Joshua is first seen fighting the enemies of the Lord. We won't take the time tonight. Well, maybe we should. Ex let's go Exodus 17. Let's take a quick look at it, because it has a couple of lessons, and, and uh, we'll indulge the time here. Uh, in Exodus 17, we have a conflict with the Amalekites. 
and um, and uh, Joshua shows up there. Verse ten, Joshua does. Moses said to him, fought with Amalek and so forth, and. And we get to verse 13, it says it all. Joshua vanquished Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Joshua did not mess around. He's not a theoretician. You know, his sword was sharp, okay? But verse 14 is kind of an interesting verse because Joshua and another idea are introduced together, and they become important together. Verse 14 of Exodus 17 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of... Of all the people? No, that's not what it says. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek uh, un- from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and on it goes. It's interesting. The concept of a book is introduced in the same place that Joshua first makes his appearance. Now you're going to discover as we go that I believe Joshua in many ways is a type. We use that term as a technical term, a model, a foreshadowing a type, in the biblical sense, of Jesus Christ. And how interested he is, John opens his gospel and says, in the beginning was the Word. He uses that as a title of who? The Logos. Of who? Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that Joshua is introduced here with an identity, if you will, with the book, and we're going to discover when we get in the first chapter of Joshua, his marriage to that book is the whole premise upon which the rest of it goes. And he's the first person to do that. See, up to then we had Moses. He had a direct discussion with God, and it was an oral face-to-face thing. From Joshua on, it's a book that's the base. It's the book that's the foundation. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. There's the great exclamation in the eighth verse of the first chapter of Joshua. We'll see shortly. So here, when Joshua first appears, we see him introduced with the book. And, and, and the Lord tells Moses, write this in a, memor- in a memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. See, he's anticipating who's going to be the leader. Joshua. We just, uh, Incidentally, um, if we turn over to another interesting thing, um, if you turn to Exodus 23, there is a strange prophecy that may have nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but let me share it with you anyway. In Exodus chapter 23, <clears throat> there's a prophecy about an angel. Now, what is an angel? A messenger, right. Most often it's a supernatural being, but not always. In the Greek, the word angelos means a messenger. It's if I'm a captain and my flank's in trouble, I may send an angelos over there to tell my lieutenant what to do. I don't have a guy with wings and a halo. I send a guy that's got a walkie-talkie and a whatever, you know. He's an angelos. He's a messenger. Okay, anyway, verse 20 in chapter Exodus 23 says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Well, that's interesting. There's somebody special coming. By the way, who, was John the Baptist a messenger? Sure, see? Okay, let me just try to use that idea. It says, verse 21, Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now remember that. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice so, uh, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto their, thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. This is a warfare kind of guy, Right? Now, it's possible that this might be a prophecy of Joshua. Huh? We're back here in Exodus. Okay, he's going to send a leader, right? He says, my name is in him, right? This is a dandy little time to pop over to Numbers 13. I've got a few other things I want to point out to you in, in, in Exodus, but while i got this idea in your mind, turn to, if you turn to Numbers 13, you'll discover Moses is picking out 12 guys to be a scouting party. Okay? And uh, from verses 4 down, he picks one from each tribe. Right? As you skim through your scriptures there, you'll find one from Reuben and Simeon and Judah and so forth. Right? From Judah, by the way, we know it's a guy by the name of Caleb. He's going to be important later. I won't mention these other guys because they, they don't come off too well. In, in verse 8, in verse 8 of the tribe of Ephraim, we have a guy by the name of Hosea, right? Isn't that interesting? And the son of Nun. But don't let that throw you, because by the time you get down to verse 16, Moses does something kind of interesting. He changes his name. Okay, okay. Yes, 
Verse 6, these are the names of the men that whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And then it asks one little footnote. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua, or more precisely, Yehoshua. Not just salvation. Jehovah is salvation. Yehoshua, by the way. That's the Hebrew. In the Greek, it would be Jesus. So Moses changes his name. Now, this little prophecy in Exodus is kind of interesting because this this angel, this messenger is going to lead him into the land and so forth, right? Is going to have whose name in him? The Lord's name's in him. That's the Lord's name's in Joshua. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, to get you a little bit of feeling of just who this guy Joshua was, let's pop back in Exodus 24, and another interesting thing happens that's kind of a fun chapter. We forget these things. You know, we all remember how, uh, see, we're victims of uh, Cecil B. DeMille and Charlton Heston and Yvonne de Carlo, that whole thing. And a lot, that wasn't quite the way it was, okay? In uh, Exodus 24, and I'm not liking the movie, I think they did a great job, but I'm just, we, we do get some blinders on from that. In uh, verse 9, uh, Exodus 24, verse 9, then went up Moses and Aaron and um, Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And that's quite a little sentence. These guys got a special treat. You know, the insiders plus 70 elders got to go up the mountain and they saw the God of Israel. Now, did they see him face to him? I'm not going to get into one of those things, you know. They, but they got some manifestation that they're obviously aware of. In verse 10, they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. See, they're, they're seeing some kind of close encounter of the eternal kind or something, right? <laughs> Verse 11, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. That's an interesting thing. They're eating and drinking with God. What a lowly strain. You know, we think of eating as sort of a biological function. God doesn't. God attaches a lot of importance to eating. When the, the Lord and the two angels visited Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, they had the three measures of meal becoming a meal offering for that from that day on in both the Arab as well as the, the uh, Jewish community. Uh, it's interesting, all the way through the scripture, we have eating as a basis of fellowship. When the Lord institutes a sacrament, he says, what, the Lord's Supper, right? It's interesting that the Lord, after his resurrection, never appears to his disciples where they're not eating with him. Every time he appears after his resurrection, he's eating them. So this idea, here it is, they even appear in Exodus, they eat and drink with the Lord. Kind of interesting. The Lord said unto Moses, verse 12, come up and uh, come uh, up to me to the, into the mount and be there and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rode up and his servant Joshua. Oh, really? How interesting. See, you pick, you, you, unless you're watching this, you may miss it. Joshua is already his sidekick, his buddy, his minister, his special. And Moses went up into the mount of God. We're going to discover, by the way, shortly, I'll show you in a minute, that when Moses has the tent of meeting, Who's in charge of it? It ain't Aaron. It's Joshua. Now, don't confuse that with the tabernacle, because most scholars believe that that tent of meeting that I'll show you in Exodus 33 was a temporary assembly place before the tabernacle itself was... Re they had been instructed, hadn't built it yet. There's a Moses has a tent that he uses for a while between before the real tabernacle. But anyway, the point, Joshua's in charge of it. Aaron was a little flaky, I guess, you know, after that calf bit. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um... And then he says to his guests, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you, and if any man have any matters to do, let him come to them. And Moses went up into the mount, and the cloud covered the mount. Now the apparent impression we get is that Joshua went with Moses further. Now he's not mentioned in the actual encounter, you with me. So the impression we get is that Joshua was allowed to go further with Moses while the rest stayed below, but he didn't go all the way, because Moses apparently, obviously, was alone later. So the, that's the impression we get. But see, you, the, main, the only thing we glean from this is Joshua is kind of a, a, you know, an inside dude. He's, a, he's, he's a getting training. And uh, we can make an interesting study of some of the training he gets, because uh, there are a lot of, he, he, he shows up in a number of places here and, and learns some valuable lessons. Um, so uh, the... Uh, Shows up at Mount Sinai, we covered that. Um, in chapter 32 and 33, he shows up. He's in charge of the tent of meeting. Uh, uh, also in Numbers 11, there's a place where there's a, uh, 70 elders are spirit-filled and they're prophesying, and Joshua gets a little jealous for Moses' own stature, and Moses points out, hey, what the Lord's doing, he's doing. You know, but Joshua's, Joshua's getting trained. That's the main idea. Now, one other dimension is we, we, in, in Numbers 13, we looked at how his name has changed. 
You don't have to bother chasing it down, but you'll discover in the King James Bible in Acts 7.45 and Hebrews 4.8, his name Joshua is translated Jesus. And if you read those Bibles without a marginal note or a footnote or something, you'll get confused because the reference is clearly to Joshua, but it's translated Jesus in those passages. And obviously, it's just, the, just to highlight to you the fact that the name Joshua here is the name Jesus in the New Testament. And, and obviously, it can lead to some confusion if you're not up to that. In Numbers 27, we can take a good look at Joshua and discover that he's uh, answered a prayer, and he's also spirit-filled. But uh, uh, I, I just as soon sort of take that for granted and jump into something that's probably far more important. Let's take a look at Numbers 14, because that gives rise. In Numbers 13... Uh, we saw these 12 spies. And I get the picture here. They've taken, the Lord has kept them for about a year and two months. I myself often have gotten confused in the chronology, but he apparently held them back for a while. But he's getting them ready. They've been trained. They're getting ready to enter the land. They're in a place called Kedesh Barnea. And uh, the Lord is saying, come on, guys, uh, we're going to go in and, and uh, you, uh, you t- should take the land that I've given you. And uh, Moses picks 12 guys to scout it out the so-called 12 spies. And uh, so uh, in, in the chapter 13, we saw they were being picked. And um, uh, in, uh, in verse 17, he sends them out to the land of Canaan and, uh, and uh, to go check it out. In verse 18, see what the... Uh, go, uh, 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 number 13, verse 18. And see the land, what it is, and the people who dwell therein, whether they are strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it is good or bad, and what cities they dwell in, whether they are in camps or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it's fat or lean, or whether there's wood therein or not, and you know, all those kinds of things, right? And uh, so... Uh, be of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. And this is about the time of the first ripe grapes, it says. Okay, so they on they go. They go in there, and they, you know, check it all out. They get to a place called uh, the Brook of Eshgal. And they cut down, uh, verse 23, from there a branch of one cluster of grapes and bore it between two upon a staff. Now, that's a bunch of grapes, gang, you know. To cut it down, it takes two men with a pole to carry this bunch of grapes. You know, you've probably seen little models or statues of the two men carrying the staff with a big, huge bunch of grapes. The grapes of Eshgal, they call it. Uh, who are the two guys carrying this thing? Joshua and Caleb, you bet. And uh, uh, that has become, of course, the symbol of the ministry of tourism in Israel today, and that's why it may be a familiar idiom to you. But they, they brought back other things, pomegranates and figs, and and uh, and so on. And uh, so uh, they, they come back after 40 days. Now, they're that, the, the length of reconnoitering here is important. It's going to come back to haunt them. Forty days. Now, verse 26, they came back to uh, Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of children of Israel, in the wilderness of Paran, and so on. And they showed them the fruit of the land. And um, verse 27, they told them, uh, We came into the land which thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, that we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and the edge of the Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. They're in their huddle here, and, and, and Caleb wants to say, Let's go, let's go get them. Yeah? But the men went up with them and said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. How tragic. They didn't take the accurate count of their strength. They neglected one person. God. You know. God and anybody's a majority, I would say. But they didn't look at it that way. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, verse 32, that they searched and the children of Israel, saying, The land, though we had gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who were come of the giants, and we, were, this is the great line, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Tremendous self-image problem we've got here. <laughs> now, what you got here is two guys, Joshua and Caleb, saying, come on, let's go, we're going to get these guys. The Lord has given us the land, it's his problem, not ours, let's get on with it. The other ten say, wait a minute, those are pretty rough dudes there. And... Uh, uh, what well, doesn't say, by the way, what the alternative plan was. You know, I don't know what the other ten said we ought to do. Not take the land? 
I mean, you know, they, they just all they're sitting there, they're they're quivering. And uh, the con- of course, that gets all the people riled up, right? Chapter 14 opens up. And the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? You know, you've got to really be careful when you murmur against God, because he's likely to give you your wish. That's exactly what they got. You're going to find God says, Okay, that's the way you want it, you got it. You're going to die in this wilderness. Your children will enter the land. You won't. Heavy, isn't it? Don't mess around when you pray. God might just give you the answer to your prayer. Okay? And uh, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we, God, that, that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore, verse 3, where the, hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Hey, guys. You're going to die in this wilderness, and your kids are going to enter the land. Only two of that original generation get to go in the land, Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses doesn't make it. Isn't that interesting? And, of course, this goes on, but that's the the main idea. And, of course, uh, uh, the Lord's upset with him, no surprise. Moses tries to plead pardon. But God, uh, uh, you know, chapter 14 goes on to develop this, and, and, he, and he promises them that they're going to go uh, in there. Uh, uh, they're going to wander in the wilderness now. Uh, verse 33 of chapter 14, he says, And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your harlotries, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. God lays it on him. He doesn't mess around. So this nation, you see, wanders. A million people. Some scholars say two million. I'm not going to quarrel details. There's a bunch. And uh, uh, they're wandering under this strange um, supervision, manna, being fed by manna, having these one episode after another where they're faced with some problem and then their faith stumbles and God, you know, has to give them another lesson. But they wander for 40 years. I mean, that's a long bivouac. That's tough. And, uh, and with the tab, but it's, it's a time of learning. It's a time of, of, of conditioning. Now, what were, what, and, and there's all kinds of things that happen, of course, and that's what the whole book of Numbers is all about. And it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating study. But it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the wandering. Now, most of us, as we study the book of Numbers, can relate to it because it's a time of setbacks and trials. One of the questions that's going to face you and I is, spiritually speaking, what does going into the promised land mean? We're going to discover Joshua's going to take his people and lead them into the promised land, right? He's going to take them across the Jordan, right? Crossing over the Jordan into the promised land. And from from hymns and, and songs we sing, we poetically describe crossing over the Jordan, entering the promised land as going to heaven, dying and going to heaven, crossing the Jordan, entering the promised rest, Right? And we use that idiom as a figure of speech, but it's not clear to me that that's biblical at all, because what's heaven like? If if crossing the Jordan, going into Canaan is going to heaven, hey, Joshua's got a sword drawn, he has battles, he loses? Is heaven going to be a place of conflict? I don't think so. So somehow, spiritually, crossing the Jordan and entering into Canaan, entering into the promised land, entering into his promised rest, isn't dying going to heaven. Most of us are on the right side of the cross, but the wrong side of Pentecost. Something is going to go on in your life, God willing, that is going to cross the Jordan, put you into his promised rest. And it's while you're here on the earth, not when you're raptured or with the Lord because he took you. There's something God has for you that you want to understand. And that's what the story of Joshua and the victory of Canaan is all about, spiritually speaking. It's the book of Ephesians is all about, spiritually speaking. So we're going to get in that dimension, too. You've got to wrestle with that. What does Canaan typify? What is it a type of? Don't believe it can be heaven. i got all kinds of dumb questions to ask you. We'll spread those out as we go here. Um, 
Well, I've prattled on here now, and you know, a lot of generics. It's probably time we entered the book. You know, it's our, it's uh, we we sit, we hear talk all about the book. Let's get into the book. There's a, I've got pages of of, of uh, superficial comments about things that probably won't get anywhere. Probably the smarter thing to do is let's just jump in, and start the book of Yehoshua, Joshua. <clears throat> just go to the Torah and turn right and get to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. The first word in the Hebrew is ve, which means and. It's a connective to the foregoing, but it's translated in the English Bible now. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Interesting how he's introduced, huh? Moses' minister. Moses, that's, he's, he's, he's the successor. He's the aide de camp. He's right at his elbow. He's, he's the guy and he's stepping in charge. To Moses, now, now the, this chapter, uh, the next, you know, eight verses are spoken to Joshua by the Lord. So let's keep that in mind. The Lord's going to give Joshua some special instruction here, and it's full of interesting stuff. Lord says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now, this could lead us, if I was really going to take us off into the bramble bush of other issues, take us off into a whole study of the covenant with Abraham. And... Um, um, and we should take a quick look because I got a <laughs> Genesis 15. Yeah, right. I mean, never let Missler miss a chance to take a detour, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're going to poke it, take a quick look at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, what did I say? I apologize, I didn't speak clearly. I've got a little bit of a cold, as you can tell. Genesis 15, that's 1-5. Huh? Okay. Um, uh, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and it's, that in itself is a whole study of what a covenant's all about. And I won't get into all that right now. It puts Abraham in a deep sleep, verse 12. Which the only time you find that before is with Adam and Eve. Um, but anyway, it says in verse 13, no, Ab Abram, know that assuredly that thy seed shall be a sojourner in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. He's speaking of Egypt, right? And also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterward they will come out with, a great, with great substance. That's his hinting of Exodus, right? Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. There's a concept that underlies it. It's a little bizarre. They don't come back to conquer Canaan until the sin is complete. Who are the Amorites? The headquarters was Jericho. Interesting little thing there. Okay, Verse 17, It came to pass that when the sun went down it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. That's the completion of this covenant thing, and I don't want to get into all that tonight, or we really will get off the subject. But verses eight, verse 18 is the verse we're after. In that same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. I don't know if the PLO has been watching this very carefully, but do you notice it goes all the way to the Euphrates? That's the land grant to Abraham. Interesting, isn't it? Now, this land grant, of course, you can follow that all the way through. Uh, from here, you can go to Exodus twenty three thirty one, then to Numbers 34, and then to Deuteronomy 11. You can carry the land grant theme all the way through. But I uh, won't take the time for all of that. But uh, um, 
let's get back to Joshua because he re, re, now incidentally in that the one thing I wanted to point out in the, in the covenant to Abraham do you notice the condition upon which Abraham got that land you notice what Abraham had to do do you notice what Abraham had to do to forfeit it there's anything that he can do is there it's not conditional is it it's an announcement it's an announcement have I given it's his there's nothing they can do to forfeit their right to the land. Interesting. Getting back to Joshua, we, I think we got down here to um, verse 2, didn't we? We're doing well. Um, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all thy people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So you notice, first of all, on the one hand, it's already been done. It's given. But that ain't enough. they got to go walk it. Right? Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon. There's something about um, this that needs to... God can give, but you must take. God has given you salvation in Jesus Christ on a cross at Calvary some 1,900 years ago. Does that mean you have salvation? Not if you don't take it. If I write out a check for one million dollars and hand it to you, have I given you a million dollars? No. You have to go to the bank and see that it bounces. No, you have to. <laughs> if you take that check and cash it, you may have some, you know, whatever the amount, assuming that my check was good. Just having the check doesn't do any good. That's useless. You've got to cash it. You have a commitment by the God of the universe who has provided his righteousness for your sin. But you've got to appropriate it to yourself at the cross. The same thing's true here. They have to appropriate the land. It's given to them. But by the way, the usurper's there. Okay? There's a usurper in charge of your life, too. You. That's another whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> have I given you, as, a, as I said unto Moses, verse 4, from the wilderness... And this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your born. That's, of course, the Mediterranean, which from where they're talking about is westward, right? That's the westward border. Shall be your born. Okay. Now, as, uh, this is all quoted in Hebrews 13 and applying to the Christian in another way, but let's, let's keep moving. Verse 5, And there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Now, if you're a military commander, that's a dynamite promise. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee in all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that a dynamite set of promises? Wouldn't you like to have those promises? Got a surprise for you. You got them all. Okay. You have the promise of his appearance in Matthew 28, 19. You have a promise of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 6. You've got a promise of him being there with no fear and being more than conquerors in 1 John 4, 4 and Romans 8, 37 and so on. You can dissect that and find a corollary in all through the New Testament, you have the same promises that he gave Joshua. Joshua was a tiger. He didn't mess around. As one writer put it, and it rings in my ears, I thought it was divine. He says, the days were not long enough for his battles. Isn't that interesting? Good. The Lord goes on. He says, be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. God makes a promise. Does he keep it? You betcha. And he promised them this land. Boy, I sure would not want to be anywhere involved in the PLO or anyone that's challenging Israel's right to the land. I've heard all the arguments. I've all heard all, heard all the humanism stuff. And, and it happens to be frail and phony as can be, but that's another issue. Setting aside a lot of well-meaning people who are tangled up in that strange controversy. Boy, I sure would not want to be one of those who would argue with Israel's right to the land. Why? Because I'd sure look at the guy who signed their title deed. He doesn't mess around. <laughs> I may not understand it all. It may seem kind of strange. 
The Lord des- designed it to be strange. It's strange. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians. I've chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And, 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 uh, and so forth. And, and the things that are not to bring the not the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. The foolishness of God. A tremendous theme in scripture. God goes out of his way to confound the wisdom of man. So if it sounds strange, don't be surprised. He intended it to. But that's what he did. And after all, last time I looked, he's God. He has the right to. It's a warning of the fathers to give them. Verse 7, only, and he goes on, the Lord is just instructing his, his leader here, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. Why do you keep the law? To keep God happy? Yeah, obviously that must be a true answer too, but what he's saying here, you do it, why? That you may prosper. God gives you rules, why? For your welfare. Not for his welfare, yours. Your breaking the law, you know, isn't going to, you know, God can handle it. Your fear is that he might. Verse 8 is the one verse out of this chapter you might want to mark and memorize. If you want to pick up something and carry with you that's a secret of life, Joshua 1.8, ingrain that in your skull. It's dynamite. The Lord personally is talking to Joshua about how to be victorious. And if you want to be victorious, it'll work for you. Let's see what it says. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Interesting verse. The first thing that hits us right between the eyes is that meditation is not optional. How often do we sort of get the idea that, boy, you ought to meditate in the, Lord, in the Word of the Lord because it's good for you and you can benefit by it and it's something it's just kind of a blessing to do. It certainly is. That's what this says. It ain't optional. Isn't that interesting? It's, meditation is not optional. It's a requirement. It's a dietetic requirement if you're going to have a spiritually healthy life. Point one. But this verse goes far beyond that. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now you and I have an easier time, because we're not under the law in a regulatory way, but we are called to obedience by Jesus Christ. And our obedience is a walk of faith. Our mission is to believe. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Who's going to make your way prosperous? Uh Uh-uh. You are. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You know, one of the other fallacies you get, at least I think so, you read some of these books by Christian authors, and you sort of think, gee, if you just pray, and then you just sort of stand in the shower and wait for it all to happen. <laughs> Let the blessings come, Lord. I've prayed, and I've, you know, I've been, I've been praying in the Spirit for three hours now, and I'm waiting for the phone to ring, that guy to offer me this whole new deal, you know. That's not what it says. That's not what this says. That thou mayest observe to do all according to written, that is written in, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then you can go out and win. Doesn't mean you're going to get it for free. You know, Joshua didn't win his battles by staying in his tent. He drew his sword and went out there, you know. But he did it after doing this. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's a dynamite promise. Now, I'm not one of these guys who says, hey, take this little verse and you'll be a rich man. No nonsense. God may not, he may spare you the, that, because it could destroy you. But what it does say, God himself says that if you uh, observe, you, you you respond to his call to obedience, that you will then make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. Dynamite verse, Joshua 1 8. Claim it. Memorize it. Bring it to the Lord. Let him lead you with it. Verse 9. Have 
Not I commanded thee. God speaking. Be strong and of good courage. You must be strong. It's fascinating. You know, uh, Joshua clearly was not. Didn't, he didn't mess around. I mean, you saw that from his history already. You'll see it going in. But I, I haven't counted them. But there must be three or four. You know, be strong and of good courage. You know, the Lord Himself is giving this guy a pep talk. You know, he's going out for the big game, and he's he's briefing him here. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. That's a dynamite. That's a dynamite teammate. I'd say. Hmm? Fabulous passage. Probably ranks with Romans 8 as one of those places you can mark when you're discouraged, you're beat up, or you've just been hit with a lawsuit or whatever. Uh, you know, take a look at this. Verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officer. And it's interesting. You know, some of you know that I've been involved in, in a secular conflict. And it's interesting how it happens that my adversary has uh, dishonored the God of Israel. And I have to be candid when I realized that I took great comfort because I knew the battle wasn't mine. Independent of what merits or demerits, I might have my position. And indeed, the curse uh, the, the, the curse of God is on this man's house, and financially, spiritually, uh, every which way. And it's uh, staggering and humbling to stand back and realize what, uh, what's, what's happening. And uh, uh, you don't mess around. God is, uh, God is incredible. Verse 10, Joshua chapter 1, verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare food supplies, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan, to go in and to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Now that's kind of a warning. It's a strange warning. You may not appreciate its significance. For 40 years these people have had it. They've been on the dole. Every night they had manna fall, Right? Every night except Friday night, they got twice as much Friday to, so they'd last them through, through Saturday, you know, the Shabbat thing. But the point is, is very, the, man, the whole idea of manna is an interesting study. You could, you could not store it. You had to get it for yourself. You couldn't get it for a loved one. They had to get their own. It's your daily feeding on the Word of God is the model, the bread of life. When Jesus Christ identifies himself with that in John, I am the bread of life, he says. He's referring to the manna. But this whole strange thing of the manna that's gone on for 40 years and fed this people, is going to end. It's going to end when they cross the Jordan. They're going into a whole new existence. That was a special provision for these 40 years of wandering. They're now going to go into the uh, into the land. And in anticipation of that, Joshua, obviously uh, being informed by the Lord, says, you know, tells his commanders, uh, go through the people, let them prepare food supplies, for within three days we'll pass over uh, and go and possess the land and so forth. In verse 12, And the Reubenites... And to the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh spoke Joshua. Now, this is another historical piece that you may be familiar with, but to review, you may recall that two and a half tribes, Reuben and Gad and about half of the guys in Manasseh, liked it east of the Jordan. They said, hey, this land looks pretty good. You guys can go and into the promised land, but we're gonna, we like it right here. And Moses makes a deal with them. He says, okay, guys, you can, you can stake this out as your area if that's what you want. However, we need you guys to help us accomplish our mission. So you can take your wives and, and, and children and let them stay here. But the able-bodied men who are in the army, you're going with us to cross the Jordan and take the land. And when the rest of the tribes, you, you do, when you've done your part to secure the land and we've, we've, we've secured the victory, then you can come back and, and claim that as your, your inheritance. That's the deal. And what Joshua is doing here is just confirming the deal that Moses had committed to them. In verse 13, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your cattle sh sh shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan, that is the east side. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, and all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord has given your brethren rest, as he hath given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrising. And the answer, Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and wherever thou sendest, we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he is that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death 
Only be strong and of good courage. Well, that's kind of a nice enforcement program there. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's called a professional development program. The disobedience is a bit career limiting, it looks like. <laughs> so, okay. So that's chapter one of the book of Joshua. We're off to a rip roaring start, but the surprises are just, are just beginning. Yehoshua, God's chosen leader. It's kind of interesting to watch a military leader. It's kind of interesting to watch, uh, you know, he doesn't deal with abstractions. He's going to be facing real live enemies, and it's going to get awfully interesting. And uh, we're going to lead up in the next several chapters. We're going to prepare ourselves for the first real battle, which is Jericho. But along the way, some interesting things are going to happen. And what I'd like you to do for next time um, is read the book of Revelation, of course. Work that in when you can. Uh, for no other reason, it's the only book that promises you a special blessing if you do. And I encourage you to do that because I think you're going to get more out of this book if you do that. But in chapter 2, we're going to discover an interesting gal, a gal by the name of Rahab. Rahab is a, um, uh, an innkeeper. Now, in the word that was rendered innkeeper, uh, it's very possible. It's very possible that at the time this was written, that's all it meant. The word in subsequent years came to mean a house of ill repute. You know, if you don't know what a house of ill repute is, it's a whorehouse with a bad reputation. But the point is, oh, yeah, that's bad. That's going to cost me, too. Yeah, that's terrible. Paul was right. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Utter mischief. Point is, is that Rahab is known as Rahab the harlot for thousands of years, and it's the irony is, from some research that I've done, it's possible it's a bad rap. It could be that she was nothing more than an innkeeper, but the word used for innkeeper subsequently meant, you know, a brothel, and therefore she was Rahab, the brothel keeper, you know, an innkeeper. The word uh, may have been corrupted later and became so when it was translated, it was inferred that she was a. And she may have been. I'm not, I'm not here to defend or attack her. I'm just highlighting a small footnote that when we meet her, we may find that she's gotten the biggest bum rap in history. Because she's known throughout the, throughout the thing. In fact, uh, uh, you know, she's uh, uh, put on a pier with Abraham by James, in terms of Abraham proving his faith and Rahab by hers. So she's, she's extolled. But she has perhaps one of the most interesting honors. She is a Gentile, and she is in the family tree of Jesus Christ. In Genesis, you'll discover there are at least four women. There's Rahab, Bathsheba, Ruth, and Tamar. And all four of those are Gentiles. And all of them have moral charges against them of some kind, except maybe Ruth. I won't put that on her. But they're all interesting. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the whole thing is kind of interesting. So you women's livers can make something of that if you like. Um, it's interesting that women at all are mentioned in the Levitical genealogy, which is a, a breach. But uh, the net of it is, is Rahab, of course, is going to have an interesting episode here that we want to read. I want you to study Rahab next time and understand what this, what is this red cord business? Uh, what is this deal that they're making with this Gentile gal? And um, she ends up marrying a prince of Judah. And she ends up having a son by the name of Boaz. And Boaz subsequently has no hesitancy in the book of Ruth to take on a Gentile bride. And he very much plays the role in the scripture in the book of Ruth as the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And it gives us a model by which we, by the only way we can understand what Revelation chapter 5 is all about. With the title deed of the earth, etc. And this whole business of redemption, what is a kinsman redeemer, is exemplified by Boaz. Anyway, his, his uh, dealing with Ruth could be very much conditioned about the fact that his own mother was a, a Gentile brought into the camp. And uh, so uh, you will study, of course, obviously Rahab next time, but you can, I want you to really study these spies. What are these spies really all about? What's going on here? These two characters that go in there. Why are they in there three days? And uh, with a little luck, we might even get into chapter 3, where they cross the Jordan. All kinds of interesting things are going to prepare them before they go to Jericho. They're going to reinstitute some memorials, and they're going to get circumcised. Can you imagine all of Israel not being circumcised for 40 years? That's amazing, isn't it? The covenant with Abraham, not observed for 40 years. Joshua fixes that. They take care of all of that. And, um, but we're going to, we're going to, uh, uh, the, uh, 
we're going to have some fun because we're going to all have this most bizarre episode called the Jericho in the, in the you know, forthcoming. Interesting book, Joshua, a model of the book of Revelation and very possibly a book of overlooked prophecy that may be very much in our time, your time and mine. Is it possible that we are alive in that generation in which another leader uh, is going to take God's people and dispossess the land of the usurpers in a much more cosmic sense than Joshua ever would have dreamed of. How interesting it is, every detail of the book in Joshua foreshadows another chronicle at the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And uh, this whole idea of signs and the sun and the moon, we're going to talk a little bit when we get to the so-called long day of Joshua. We'll talk about the theories of some of these NASA scientists and so forth and and the uh, various orbital mechanics that may have been involved and all of that. We'll get into that. But is it possible that God indulge this bizarre train of physical events in Joshua's day, if for no other reason than to form a model of another set of cosmic events that will be uh, affect the battle when another Yehoshua is, is engaging his enemies. And how interesting it is, all the little details of, of the seven nations and the, ten horn, you know, the, ten, the, ten, the seven heads and ten horns that we see in, in Daniel and we see in Revelation 13 and so forth, climaxing, of course, in the Battle of Armageddon and all that sort of stuff. How interesting it is that it's all anticipated in the book of, uh, in the book of Joshua. And uh, even to the extent that the kings hide themselves in the, in, a, uh, in the caves. Read ahead in Joshua. Try to figure out who this guy Adonai Zedek is. Look for your own parallels. The more you read the book of Joshua and read Revelation, you'll probably find things that none of us have seen, too, in terms of, hints that the Holy Spirit is intentionally pointing us to compare and contrast the two books, and thus highlighting the book of Joshua not just as a book of exciting history that really happened, not only as a book that will have a practical impact on your life and mine and how we win or lose, but also a book that will give us a hint of maybe a little different perspective, a little more clear glimpse of what Revelation is really trying to tell us, especially in our day when it's all so close. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Bizarre stuff. How great it is that there is a living God and that he cares about you and me enough to have this appointment to talk about it, to present himself as a, as a vital champion to help you win your battles today, tomorrow, and throughout eternity. It's by our hearts. Father, we just praise you that you indeed are our God and our champion. We thank you for the words that we should be strong and of good courage, that you are with us. And that with you, with, when you are with us, who can be against us? And that through you, we are more than conquerors to him that loved us so much as to give himself for us, that through him we might have life everlasting. Let me just ask you to fill us with your spirit, increase in us a hunger for your word, a passion for your choices. Help us to just... Grow in grace the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that in all these things we might be pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.